when would you say was the first time that you saw Dragon Ball Z? Was I 19, I think? My l earliest memory that I can recall right now was when I was on holidays in America and we were watching TV and I saw an ad for Dragon Ball Z and I remember thinking, I've heard of this. When I was younger, you got like a ton of small Dragon Ball toys and when my friends would come over, we used to like play with them all the time. And I was watching the ad <laughs> and literally, I was only like eight, nine, no, I was nine years old at the time. And even as a stupid nine-year-old, <laughs> I was watching this and I was like, this looks stupid. <laughs> I don't like this at all. I'm glad I don't watch this. And now I know I was like kind of wrong. Cause, like, well, no, I was right. It is stupid, but like, you know, it's, it's cool. It's fun. It wasn't as bad as nine-year-old me thought it was. As it currently stands, Dragon Ball Super is a hugely lucrative property and is arguably the most profitable IP owned by Toy Animation Studios and Shueisha today. However, it hasn't always been that way. Following the run the franchise had in the 80s and 90s was always going to be an uphill struggle. But I doubt many anticipated the ups, the downs, the controversy and the backlash the series received on its journey to meet that 100 episode milestone. In 2015, the Dragon Ball series re-emerged after a 17 year long hiatus to meet a very different anime industry, one that had played a leading role in influencing, for better or worse. Now, we got a lot to cover. Video games, merchandise, production, animation, story, ratings and manga. I'm here to cover it all today, and to chronicle the events that serve to build the platform Dragon Ball Super currently stands upon. This is Dragon Ball Super, 100 episodes later. At the time, I was a big fan of Yu-Gi-Oh! And I remember looking for, like, to see if Yu-Gi-Oh! was on, because it would normally be around on that time. And I remember going on, and it was, like, the first time I ever saw Dragon Ball. I think it was Goku and Piccolo versus Raditz. So, oh, Jesus, that's a long time ago. Uh, I remember I, I was in China. Uh, it was a pretty normal thing, because the posters plaster all over China. Like, it's pretty popular. And we started watching it. And uh, I remember it was uh, Broly. It was, uh, that, that, that was the first one like I ever watched. With the manga having come to a close in 1995 after 11 years of publication, the brass behind the Dragon Ball licensing endeavored to create an anime-only continuation to the Dragon Ball story. This idea led to the creation of 1996's Dragon Ball GT. However, this venture didn't exactly turn out to be the roaring success Toei Animation Studios wanted from its former top property. And so, on November 19th, 1997, on Fuji TV, Dragon Ball GT aired its final episode, episode 64, only a year and a half into its production. On that same year, Dragon Ball GT Final Bout for the PlayStation was released and again to lackluster sales, selling a disappointing 270,000 units worldwide. With an exhausted Akira Toriyama stepping away from Dragon Ball entirely, and GT having signaled the end of the series, it looked as though Toy Animation had to put the literal and proverbial pen down with the once highly successful Dragon Ball franchise. Toei Animation's Dragon Ball department had its doors closed indefinitely, ensuring that not only was there not going to be a continuation of the Dragon Ball story, but for the first time in over 10 years, no plans were made for future Dragon Ball video games for any console. This was made even more jarring due in no small part to the fact that during the 11 years prior, from 1986 to 1997, the Dragon Ball franchise had produced 23 officially licensed video games, averaging over two games a year. However, while the Japanese public was turning its attention away from Dragon Ball, 6,000 miles away on the other side of the planet, Dragon Ball was garnering more attention, introducing itself to a brand new, young audience. We had like three channels or something at my house. Um, and so one time we were at my granny's and she had um, like satellite, which was big at the time. And the, the first time me and my two brothers saw anything even like Dragon Ball Z, like we only watched like, like Ed, Ed and Eddie and all that kind of crack. But the first time we saw Dragon Ball Z was at her house. And it was the episode where Goku is fighting Vegeta and he's like the giant monkey guy. <laughs> that was a long time ago. I think it was actually my friends playing it that um, I first was introduced to it. And then I got interested in anime and wanted to watch it because a lot of my friends started watching the Kai version. The short fat guy with the sword cuts off his tail. Like there was like six episodes or something in a row that we watched. And we were like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. 
1994, a company called Funimation Productions, headed by Gen Fukunaga, acquired the rights to dub into English and broadcast the original Dragon Ball in syndication, through a connection with an uncle working in Toei Animation. In 1995, the decision was made to begin production on a Dragon Ball Z dub for North America. Funimation collaborated with Saban Entertainment to finance and distribute the series to television and contracted Ocean Studios in Canada to dub the anime into English, with Funimation overseeing the dub's production. Ocean Studios' cast listing was as follows. Peter Kalamas took on the lead role of Goku, with Brian Drummond taking on the role of Vegeta. Gohan was Saffron Henderson, Piccolo, Scott McNeil, Bulma, Maggie Blue O'Hara, and Terry Klassen filled the role of Krillin. Many of you might remember Brian Drummond's performance as the Vegeta, which coined the term over 9,000. Brian Drummond is a god. I'm not really a dub guy. Like, I, I I appreciate some of the stuff they do with Kai, but I just, I'm not, I'm not big on it. But like, Brian Drummond is a phenomenal Vegeta, and Scott McNeil, there, there, are, there are basically no English actors that I go, hmm, you're probably, probably better than your Japanese counterpart. And, and as much as I love... Uh, Furukawa's Piccolo, Scott McNeil is so fucking good because he just, he captures that demonic side of Piccolo so well. I sat down and I started trying to watch the Ocean cast and, and the, the dub that I'd grown up with and, and within like five episodes I was like, wow, this is really dated. This is not, this is not working for me. There are nice moments here and there, but this is not a show for adults. Certain changes were made to the show to help cater for an English speaking audience and a younger demographic. These changes included, but were not limited to, the editing of the first 67 episodes down to 53, the removal of any mentions of the word death, replacing it with terminology like the next dimension, and removing any overly violent moments with digital touch-ups. Dragon Ball Z first hit American screens in the fall of 1996. However, it wasn't until the fall of 1998 that Dragon Ball Z found the audience it was looking for. I am Jason DeMarco. I am Sean Akins. I'm the original creator of Toonami. In 1998, Cartoon Network was trying to expand and build a block that primarily consisted of American animation and Japanese anime. Uh, DBZ came on at like 5.30 in the morning on channel 69 in Atlanta and kids were setting their alarm and like waking up at 6.30 on Sunday or whatever to watch this crazy show and then my friends started doing it so I was watching it and then you would get bootleg VHS tapes. That was when I thought there could be something here and if kids are willing to get up this early on Sunday and watch this show, what if we put it on at 5 o'clock in the afternoon? What could happen? <laughs> And that's when it blew up. What was your favorite moment in Dragon Ball Z? I was on a family trip in France uh, and I found the Dead Zone movie on DVD at the place we were staying in French. And I just remember watching it. My dad was there because he spoke French and I, and I remember he would like give me, he wouldn't like say in detail what everyone was saying, but he would give me basic symptoms of, oh, this guy said that, that guy said that. And the one scene that would always stuck with me for whatever reason was when Piccolo was fighting one of Garlic's henchmen, I think his name was Sancho when he hits him and he like sends him off to the distance and he just blasts him. There are so many good moments like Vegeta sacrificing himself. It was a great moment for his character development. Like you, you could see that he actually cares and he often puts up this kind of wall where you know he, he wants to be a proud prince but he actually has feelings. Part where uh, Gohan transformed where Android 16 got his head crushed and just that scream along with the music that was like hands down that that's my favorite moment of like the whole show. Oh like when he was just when he defeated Cell and like at the start when he was like toying with him after he had like that really emotional outburst. When Vegeta like sacrifices himself to try and kill Boo and you know like Boo's fucking shit so he just comes back together anyway. Boo's a bad villain. <laughs> Team Gohan going Super Saiyan 2 is very near and dear to me. <laughs> uh, it's basically because I main Team Gohan in every Dragon Ball Z fighting game. That's, yeah. <laughs> I put a lot of thought into it. Instead of re-upping Sabin's musical score that was currently used for the Ocean dub and recontracting Ocean dub services, Funimation would begin using their own in-house talent, based in Fort Worth, Texas, USA, to dub the rest of the series from episodes 54 onwards. How many pages is this script? Approximately 600. Is that unusually long? Uh, yes. All the Godfather movies in, in script format maybe would, maybe would be this big. 
Maybe all the Star Wars movies, all six, would be this big. The new cast included Sean Schimmel as Goku, Christopher Sabat as Vegeta, Stephanie Nadalny as Gohan, Christopher Sabat again as Piccolo, Tiffany Vollmer as Bulma, and Sonny Strait as Krillin. Here, why don't I teach you a thing or two about Saiyans? What you're seeing now, this is my normal state. In 1999, season three of Dragon Ball Z with Funimation's in-house dub was the highest rated program ever at the time on Cartoon Network. By 2002, the week ending September 22nd, Dragon Ball Z was the number one program of the week on all of television with tweens 9 to 14, boys 9 to 14, and men 12 to 24, with the Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday telecasts of Dragon Ball Z ranked as the top three programs in all of television, broadcast, or cable. By 2003, Dragon Ball Z had become a runaway success all across the world. What's important to note at this point is that from GT's original end in 1997 up until 2002, the only new additions to Dragon Ball made by Toei were licensing agreements. That might not seem like much, but in doing so, Toei Animation licensed Dragon Ball to all of these stations, production companies, and businesses. This included revenue splits for toy manufacturing, game sales, digital media sales, and the TV show itself. Translation, this meant that Toy Animation would receive an agreed upon slice of the profits that all of these companies made from releasing Dragon Ball in their respective countries. With the impressive success Dragon Ball was seeing outside of Japan, Shueisha decided it was time to reopen the Dragon Ball property and begin planning for the future, not with anime just yet, but with a re-release of the manga and a string of new video games. In 2002, for the first time in five years, the brass behind Dragon Ball finally released a new video game. Officially licensed Dragon Ball Z Budokai, developed by Dim's Corporation, a development studio based out of Osaka, Japan, and produced by Bandai, 2002's Dragon Ball Z Budokai was a roaring monetary success on all fronts, and was the first time a Dragon Ball game had a full European release, selling almost 3.8 million units worldwide, almost tripling the former decade's best-selling titles, and grossing 14 times more revenue than Dragon Ball GT Final Bout for the PlayStation. The success emanating from the release of Dragon Ball Z Budokai encouraged the Dragon Ball license holders to fund future Dragon Ball projects. Due to 2002's resurgence of Japanese public interest in the Dragon Ball property, on December 4th of that year, Shueisha began to re-release the original manga in a complete Kanzenban, or perfect edition format. The Kanzenban release condensed the original 42 volumes into 34, with each volume containing approximately 15 chapters. Unlike the Tankoban, or the original release of the manga. The Kanzenban retained all of the colored pages originally printed in Weekly Shonen Jump. The main difference between the two releases, however, new artwork from Akira Toriyama was present on each subsequent cover, and the volumes were slightly larger in size. Akira Toriyama also took it upon himself to alter the ending of the story slightly, illustrating a few more panels in an attempt to create a more satisfying ending. Around the same time as the release of the Dragon Ball Kanzenban, during the winter of 2002, it was announced by Toei Animation that the entire 291 episode Dragon Ball Z TV series would be released on DVD, spanning two massive box sets known as the Dragon Boxes. The first 147 episodes of the series were released in March of 2003 and the latter half in September of that same year. 2004 saw the box set release for the original Dragon Ball TV series, 2005 saw the release of GT, and in 2006 we received a box set release of all the movies. Much the same as when Dragon Ball was at the height of its popularity in Japan, each subsequent year from 2002 onwards saw a new officially licensed Dragon Ball video game, each title exceeding the sales of the former decade's best, and despite Dragon Ball Z's run being completed, these video game releases wouldn't reach their highest heights until the release of 2007's Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkaichi 3, which sold over 4 million units worldwide. This marked the highest grossing Dragon Ball video game in history. To help put this in perspective, Budokai Tenkaichi 3 outsold 80% of all Tekken games, 95% of all Street Fighter games, 95% of all Mortal Kombat games, every UFC game, and every boxing game including Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. And if we look specifically at anime series that later produced video games, Dragon Ball has been by far the most successful, surpassing One Piece, Naruto, Attack on Titan, and Bleach's best efforts. I am by no means suggesting that Budokai Tenkaichi 3 is a better game than any of the others listed above. What I am hoping to illustrate here is that after Dragon Ball Z's boom in North America, the desire fans had for more Dragon Ball was made abundantly clear. Between 2002 and 2007, the Dragon Ball franchise had sold over 16.5 million games worldwide. 
Did you guys play the Dragon Ball video games? Like a motherfucker. <laughs> I played uh, all the Budokais, all the Budokai Tenkai Chis. Team Gohan all the way. Guys, Team Gohan. I mean, from what I've seen, they all look cool. But from what I've heard, like, some of them are really bad. And not, people are like, oh, well, this series is the best one. Everything after that is shit. And I literally have no opinion either way. Dragon Ball Fighter Z looks cool, though. Uh, Xenoverse. Just a bit of it, though. You could play, you know, as a different character, but you, you were there in the moment when things happened from the episode, so it was really fucking exciting. I, I'm looking into Xenoverse 2. I think that looks good. And do you see the Dragon Ball Fighter Z or Fighters ever? I'm kind of all about that. <laughs> I have the uh, Dragon Ball B Budokai uh, for uh, PS2. And <laughs> I was obsessed with that, played through it three times, got unlocked everything, I deleted the file and played it again. <laughs> I have friends who are like into fighting games and they, I remember that I would used to prefer Raging Blast, the Budokai Tenkaichi games, the more 3D open space ones. And they'd always be like, ah, oh, no, the more like side view ones of Budokai are kind of better. And I remember when I was younger, I used to be like, oh, what is this? This is, this is dumb. But then I actually play a bit of those games uh, fairly recently and I was like, oh, these are, this actually is just better made. I used to play Budokai 2 and I remember because when we first got out, we didn't have a memory card or it didn't work on our PS1. So we'd have to like, I would literally like pause it and we'd go out for like hours and I'd come back and I'd like snap if the TV like turned off or something. Oh, I loved it. I thought there was like, it would meet your expectations, but more. Like there was never like, you can level 9,000 is like the highest level and then like all of a sudden it's like a billion and it doesn't even matter anymore. But it was, it was hilarious, I loved it. My older brother got one of the newer ones for Christmas a couple of years ago and uh, himself and my younger brother were kind of playing it, you know, fighting amongst themselves on it. Uh, and I was, I think I was building like a, a Lego Death Star or something. <laughs> because you know, that's what I do with my free time on Christmas. <laughs> and uh, they asked me like, here, come on, do you want to sit down and have a fight with us? I said, yeah, sure, no worries. Uh, I sat down, they both been playing for a couple of hours now at this stage, and I beat both of them my first go, and then I never played the game again, so I retired at a 100% success rate. With the newfound success of Dragon Ball in the West, and the resurgence of popularity with a younger generation in Japan, thanks to the Kanzen Ban and the Dragon Boxes, on the 21st of April 2008, it was announced on weekly Shonen Jump magazine that a new OVA for Dragon Ball would be aired to celebrate Shonen Jump's 40th anniversary. This new installment in the Dragon Ball franchise saw the return of not only all of our favourite characters to the silver screen, but for the first time since 1995, series creator Akira Toriyama returned to write the story this new OVA was entitled Yo! Son Goku and His Friends Return. And so they did return with brand new animation and a familiar writing style. To this date, it has yet to receive a wider Western release, however, only being available in its native Japanese language with subtitles. After the appraisal the OVA received, Toei Animation and Shueisha wanted the momentum to continue, endeavoring to greenlight a new Dragon Ball anime TV series in 2009. However, Akira Toriyama stood firm with his prior convictions, stating that he was done with Dragon Ball, still burnt out from the decade he had dedicated to the material in the 80s and 90s. Still wanting to fill the Dragon Ball void that there was in the Japanese market while trying to avoid the commercial disaster that was Dragon Ball GT, Toei Animation decided to begin production on a new project. Watch Dragon Ball Z the way it was meant to be seen. Dragon Ball Z Kai. Dragon Ball Kai was a high-definition remastered cut of the original Dragon Ball Z TV series. It premiered on Fuji TV on April 5th, 2009 at 9am just before One Piece. During its two-year syndication on Japanese television, Dragon Ball Kai consistently appeared in the top 10 highest rated anime TV series every week. Dragon Ball Kai was later dubbed and released in numerous countries worldwide, again reintroducing and in some cases introducing Dragon Ball to the public eye. However, Dragon Ball Kai wasn't the only Dragon Ball related property to be released that year. On March 13th and April 10th, 2009, 20th Century Fox and director James Wan brought Dragon Ball Evolution to thousands of movie screens across Asia and the Western world. The movie bombed critically, receiving negative to average reviews across the board worldwide. The website Rotten Tomatoes gave the film a score of 14% based on 58 reviews. Before the film's release, Dragon Ball creator Akira Toriyama initially felt surprised by Dragon Ball Evolution and suggested to his fans to treat it as an alternate universe version of his work. Years later, in an interview with the Asai Shimbun, Toriyama revealed that he felt the Hollywood producers did not listen to his ideas or suggestions, citing that the final version was not on par with the original source material. Finally, in 2016, while discussing the film in the Dragon Ball 30th Anniversary Super History book, Toriyama wrote, 
I had put Dragon Ball behind me, but seeing how much that live action film ticked me off. Dragon Ball Evolution ran in many theaters through the summer of 2009. However, Dragon Ball Kai continued to air on TV screens all over the world up until its 97th episode on March 27th, 2011. Uh, we, we watched Kai until it was a fair bit into the Cell Saga. It was like towards the end of the Cell Saga, we swap, swapped over to, nor to normal original Z. Uh, we just kind of binge watch it in periods. So like six, seven of us would get together, get some food, popcorn, sit down in someone's front room and just watch about maybe seven episodes at once then go home because like two in the morning. I enjoyed Kai a lot more because it cut out like a load of stuff but also that means like there's a load of characters that people talk about I'm like I don't know who that is because they just don't exist to me because their arc was obviously not important at all on July 21st 2012 during Psycho V Jump Festa a short teaser trailer announcing the film Dragon Ball Z Battle of Gods was shown and on March 30th 2013 Toy Animation Studios released its 18th movie Dragon Ball Z Battle of Gods I feel like I feel like I have a memory of me hearing about it and then like the next time I saw you going there, is there a new Dragon Ball thing happening? Oh Jesus, yeah I was hyped because uh, GT was disappointed <laughs> Did like you know I, I, I was uh, on a scout for any news with Dragon Ball and stuff and when they announced it I was through the roof <laughs> I think my reaction was some level of not necessarily like hugely excited but I was like oh that's cool Dragon Ball's coming back and I then remember seeing how mind-blowingly excited everyone else was getting. And while I didn't necessarily have like that level of excitement that everyone else had, I do remember being like, I'm glad that people are getting so passionate about this. Oh, I saw it ages ago. I, th I thought it was awesome. Like the new characters that were introduced, the character design was, was completely different from what we knew before. So it was refreshing, but they kept the tone of Dragon Ball Z. So they kind of combined the two together very well and I really loved it. They instantly like kind of brought out this new kind of form, which was pretty class because he looked like he like turned into like this young guy. It was it was it was I didn't like it as much compared to the old series like Dragon Ball Z, but I could still see was they didn't just bring it back because they wanted to make money. They actually had a good idea and they wanted to make something that was really good. At the time, it was the best quality like you know that, that, as an animation wise I've ever seen Dragon Ball in. This was the first new major feature to come out of Dragon Ball since the time GT was on the air back in the late 90s. However, unlike GT, Battle of Gods had one other vital added benefit. It was very, very clear that Toriyama had involvement with Battle of Gods because that Goku on screen there was very, very different from what we'd seen in the past, even even in Z, which is obviously a direct um, adaptation of the manga, it just felt so him, the way that Goku acted and responded to things, it was like that perfect blend of, you know, that, that childlike nature that everyone kind of loves about Goku, and then there was also the serious side of things. A lot of the Dragon Ball movies had a formula in which villain shows up, Goku and his friends fight the villain, they struggle, Goku or somebody unleashes a powerful attack or transformation to defeat the villain within the last five minutes and then they close and the plot doesn't change at all afterwards. And this was the first time where it's like, no, they're not defeating Beerus, they're fighting him, they actually lose. Initially planning on staying distant from the material itself, after reading the script and the details of the character Beerus, he took it upon himself to illustrate and alter the characteristics of him. This led to further character designs, script realterings, and gags being written for the movie. Before he knew it, Toriyama had found himself much more involved than he had ever intended. To think that Dragon Ball Evolution, widely considered an insult to the Japanese property, played a pivotal role in compelling Toriyama to participate in the creation of another Dragon Ball series. The animation that was showcased in the film was polished but vastly different to what fans recognized from the 90s. This was a clear indication that the animators from the 90s had all but gone. Animators like Naoki Tate, Masahiro Shimanuki, Naoto Shishida, and Tadayoshi Yamamoto were some of the veterans that remained from that golden era. The latter of which, Tadayoshi Yamamoto, while once being heralded as Toei's most proficient Dragon Ball animator, has since fallen from grace. Once responsible for crafting some of the most memorable scenes in the series, the long break from the franchise has not been kind to his abilities. 
This wouldn't be as large an issue as I am making it out to be if it wasn't for the fact that during the production of the movie Battle of Gods, Yamamura was assigned the position of lead animation director, which afforded him the authority to trace over the animation of other younger talented animators. This allowed the movie to look as though it was drawn by one individual, Yamamura, leading to scenes looking more consistent aesthetically. However, some have drawn attention to this fact stating that it didn't matter how talented the animators were under him, it was his style that shone through. For the production of Dragon Ball Z Kai, this became commonplace, many in the community critiquing his modern work comparing it to his earlier pieces. This came to the forefront of the industry however with the release of the movie Battle of Gods in 2013, when a popular young animator named Yoshimichi Kameda, famous for producing key animation sequences in shows like One Punch Man and Full Metal Alchemist, came out on Twitter citing his frustrations with Yamamuro. I can't hide my shock. Give me the soft designs of the Maeda Minoru period. During the 90s, Maeda Minoru was the man responsible for how Dragon Ball Z's characters looked. This man was in charge of dictating what the characters looked like by producing character design sheets, with which the animators beneath him would use as reference when drawing the characters in the show. Kameda was publicly badmouthing the new character designs supplied by Yamamuro. All of that aside, comments such as these didn't deter fans from showing up in their droves to support the movie, and for it to be overall critically acclaimed grossing 51.2 million US dollars in the global box office, 30 million of which was achieved domestically in Japan. As it stands, Dragon Ball Z Battle of Gods sits as the 26th highest grossing anime movie of all time. What would you say is your favorite moment from Battle of Gods? Uh, favorite moment? Oh yeah. It was the part where uh, Goku and Beerus was under, uh, underground and uh, uh, Goku's god of power is uh, running out and then just uh, he, he screamed at that music and he's charged at Beerus and that one, yeah. At Bulma's birthday party uh, when Beerus is there and just like he's just interacting with everyone and it's like before the actual fighting starts from the time that he shows up to just his interactions with everyone I found very enjoyable. Um, Goku's fighting Beerus in the cave and then he was like I'm not gonna let you destroy my world you know and that he just goes mental that was Beerus kind of made like a huge blast and like went down to them and Goku like was like just dying and he like literally just did everything he could just to destroy a blast. And then when he did it you were so happy he was like he almost won a battle but then you realised you could just tell how strong Beerus was compared to Goku. Animation and box office reception aside, the most important aspect to take away from this release was its story and what it meant for the future of the franchise. The film introduced us to the character Beerus and the position he holds in the Dragon Ball world. That position being the God of Destruction, tasked with destroying planets he deems as being unworthy of remaining intact. However, the most important piece of dialogue in the movie comes during the final moments. After defeating Goku, Beerus explains that he is the God of Destruction of this universe, the Seventh, going on to explain that this universe Goku resides within is one of 12 universes, with the others having spawned warriors even more powerful than either of them. Alongside introducing numerous new characters, Dragon Ball Z Battle of Gods expanded the Dragon Ball world unlike any other installment in the franchise, allowing room for new, interesting and dynamic stories to be told, which as it turns out wasn't that far around the corner. The success Battle of Gods found and what it meant for the franchise wasn't the only bit of good news for Dragon Ball. As I stated prior, Dragon Ball Kai was considered complete with the ending of the Cell Saga, allowing room for the airing of a new anime by the name of Toriko. However, on the 21st of February 2014, the official Twitter account for the Toriko anime announced that the show will end on March 30th after three years. Shortly after, it was revealed by Shueisha's V Jump magazine that Dragon Ball Kai will retake that time slot beginning April 6th, 9am on Fuji TV. This particular run for Kai was to bring the series to completion and up to date with the prior run of Dragon Ball Z. And if you'd believe it, Dragon Ball, a now runaway train of success, had still more surprises in store for its fans. What did you guys think of Resurrection F? Like, I liked it, but some of the moments in uh, like to me Frieza was dead ah uh, I, I was really disappointed with that like it's, it's pretty much just showing off a Super Saiyan Blue no the action was co cool and that's pretty much it but uh, I didn't really get as hyped like bringing back Frieza was a compl like to me it was complete just you know for marketing um, I very much enjoyed the Resurrection F song the theme song for Frieza but I think just as an entry in the series itself as a standalone film, I think it's a fun entry. I think it's like a fun romp. But like, I liked the, the moment where um, Vegeta got to beat the shit out of him. Finally. 
you know? I kind of wanted Vegeta to beat him because Vegeta always seemed to hate him so much more than Goku. Barring some bits with the CGI, the action is like pretty well done. The 18th movie to be produced for Dragon Ball acted as the continuation to the story brought forth by Battle of Gods. This movie was Dragon Ball Z Resurrection F, featuring the return of one of the most iconic villains in the history of the series, Frieza. While headline catching, this move was met with controversy, some excited for the return of the infamous character while others meeting the announcement with a rolling of the eyes. It was fun to watch, fun fights, fun animation, don't get me wrong, and I love Frieza. The film has a lot of problems, it has no second act, the story was not very good, there's too many unanswered questions, there's too many ass pulls. To put it very, very simply, as someone who's now seen it a bajillion times, I can say that it is definitely not a good follow-up to that film. It felt like a step backwards in so many ways. With Battle of Gods, it expanded the universe just exponentially with the idea of gods of destruction and other universes and, and this new godly power that was that was like, this is a new thing. And then Resurrection F comes around and it just shrinks everything again. I suppose the idea, I don't want to sound like every other fan, but I can't lie about this. Vegeta should have been the one to kill Frieza. I like have a really soft spot for Vegeta. Like he wants it so bad. I think I've spoken to you about this before. He just let Vegeta have it, you know? <laughs> Fuck Goku with he's just, oh, I'm getting everything all the time. Vegeta wants it more than anyone else. I'm very passionate about this. Resurrection F was released on April 18th, 2015. Grossing $65 million at the worldwide box office, it was clear that there was still a huge amount of interest in this new Dragon Ball property. 10 days following the release of their most successful movie to date, Toei Animation issued a press release that would shake the Japanese anime industry. I think I was trying to find One Piece episodes and then I got his website and after watching that I just saw in the corner of Dragon Ball Super I was like, oh, they're making a series. I just saw a bunch of posts about people talking like, oh, there's going to be a new Dragon Ball anime and I just remember seeing people getting like really excited. But I remember seeing that and thinking, oh, it's probably some kind of like, it's probably some kind of like joke or like April Fool's thing that people are doing. I found about it from you. Now I was really excited. Again, kind of like with Battle of Gods, I wasn't necessarily like hugely excited, but I was like, oh, cool. I wonder what they'll do with it. On April 28th, 2015, Toy Animation announced production of Dragon Ball Super, the first all-new Dragon Ball television series to be released in 18 years. Set to debut July 5th, 2015, this would immediately follow the completion of Dragon Ball Kai's finale. The fact that it was coming so soon was just kind of mind-blowing to me. It's funny, it's funny looking back now as, as someone who's aware of everything that went on on the production side of things. That should have been massive alarm bells going off. But at the time, at the time it was just like, oh my god, it's two months away, let's go! Woo! Hype train, let's, let's do this! It had a very different start. Uh, and that's not necessarily a good or a bad thing, but it, ha it did have a very different start to kind of to the rest of Dragon Ball and to a lot of other like shonen series. It was more child friendly and I wasn't a fan of that. And the animation sucked. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, the Pilaf gang. Oh my god. Why are they there? Like there's literally like no function for them in the entire series except that they try to do something minute and they just fail anyway. Like there's nothing. Like just get them out. And then like Filler episodes would have them in it, and they'd have these tiny backstory lines, and I'm just like, this is the most boring thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Like, how about you just like, do anything else, and I'll be happy, yeah. To, to be honest, all, all I heard was just negative, like I, I read article about how the animation is jarring, and how they're gonna fix it in the, like the Blu-rays and stuff. And, but, but like the, the storyline, it's, you know, recapped from the movie, so it, I just didn't think of much point of it. I just, I remember, like seeing like everyone how like hugely excited everyone was getting um but at the same time i do remember the kind of nervousness that people had when everyone found out that the first two arcs would just be translating those movies into arcs based some years after the events of the majin buu saga of dragon ball z super picked up and reintroduced the world to the colorful cast of characters dragon ball had assembled through the years with the basic narrative covered in this part being primarily the conflicts between goku and the newly introduced lord beerus the god of destruction not an obviously evil character with many redeeming qualities beerus since his unveiling in 2013 has become a fan favorite 
However, despite many viewers enjoying Beerus, this did not distract from the fact that many had seen it before. It had now become abundantly clear. Toy Animation had made the decision to cover the last two movies released in the first two arcs of Dragon Ball Super, leading to many fans' disappointment. I remember watching episode one and being a little bit underwhelmed, but because it was the first episode of a new series, I kind of didn't feel like I could voice that. I don't know, I don't really know how to explain that too well, but I, it was almost like I couldn't admit to myself that I was kind of a bit underwhelmed by that first episode. I was a bit underwhelmed by the fact that we, were, we weren't really going into new content here. The storyline Dragon Ball Super was presenting had a conclusion many fans watching already knew. Despite the vast majority of fans slating this creative decision, viewership held and some praised the show for many fight sequences during Goku's final confrontation with Beerus. Backlash over repetition, however, was the least of Toei Animation's problems with Dragon Ball Super's premiere arc, Battle of Gods. Okay. <laughs> Is that Goku? Not a fan of Japanese King Kai. He does not sound enough like Cartman. It's not very dynamic, is it? <laughs> oh, his voice. Oh, his voice is not nice. <laughs> There's a lot of bad art in this, uh, in this clip. He looks much different than I remember in that shot. I see Beerus, he doesn't know. Go now Goku's gonna stop holding back. <laughs> Take off his weighted undies. Yeah, there was a... Like, I might be looking at it with nostalgia goggles, but I remember the fight scenes being crazy in Dragon Ball Z. And in that one, there was an awful lot of, like, static camera. Like, it was just kind of a, the one shot and characters moving around in that plane. It, well, it looked, like, dated. It looked old. If I'm not gonna lie. But, um... Like, which, what season is that? That came out about two years ago. Oh. Okay. I mean, I don't know how much uproar there was, but I mean, watching it, I would definitely say like, man, that's, that's pretty bad. <laughs> and I, I, the way I remember it anyway is like, you know, like cameras following fists and punches and explosions and mountains shattering when people scream and that kind of stuff, you know? As far as like your man and uh, Goku dancing around, there's not much, there's not much happening there. Goku looks like an ugly man a lot of the time there. I mean, I don't think I'd be wrong in saying Dragon Ball as a property is the most well-known anime ever around the world. So like you'd think they had to get a bit more time to like draw their drawings. Yeah, wasn't there something weird with um, that one as well? They released like a movie and a show and they were like the same storyline and same arc. Yeah. That seems like it would have pissed a lot of people off. Yeah. Like you're excited for the first new Dragon Ball series in however long and it's just rehashes of movies. It got to the point where, just from a visual point of view, you could tell it was just bad. Like, you could look at the artwork, you could look at the movements. Like, it didn't take an anime expert to realize how bad it was. I'm a casual person when it comes to understanding the actual anime process, and yet I could dissect how bad this is. I think they rushed certain things. Like, I would like to know more about Beerus and Whis, you know? But, and, like, I'm not... 100% a big fan of the pure comedy like the amount of comedy that is being tr thrown at you you know I prefer to, to have a more serious theme I was really disappointed because a drug mode Z even though they have uh, moments where the animation is a bit off but in general it's very fluid it really encapsulating and especially I've been watching that show for about like 10 or 20 times you know it's, I know every single moment of it like and uh, just th this new style of animation is especially with the uh, like they, they got rid of the edginess you know it just it just looks off you know to me i think a lot of the criticism that people were giving super's animation back then was very very fair it was impossible to deny that the show did not look very good i think some of the stuff during the battle of god's arc was probably overblown episode five aside which was obviously uh you know a, a very very sore mark uh, on the franchise that I don't think has ever really gone away somehow, which is strange to me. But no, I think my, my main issue with the response that it got was mostly due to how it was being reported. It wasn't, it wasn't being reported accurately. It didn't seem like anyone was interested in getting to the bottom of what actually happened. It was more just, you, you heard the same old tired 
incorrect things about, oh, it's just budget, oh, low budget, oh, lazy animators not trying, low budget, and it's just, that's not, that's not what happened. Norohiro Hayashida, producer at Toei, though not one currently working on Super, stated in an interview with the Anime News Network, The animators responsible for those scenes are newbies, who just started working at this level in the industry, which means their skills are still evolving right now. Hayashida claimed that the quote, bad animation in question was the result of inexperienced animators' work coming under scrutiny from the public. That was what really inspired me to investigate, you know, what happened and, and actually reach out to you know, animators who were on that episode. These people do have Twitter. I remember asking Ken Otsuka, who was the top credited key animator on the episode, I, I said, you know, what happened with episode five? And he just said, in true vague Japanese fashion, he just said there was an animation breakdown. Many in Super staff worked on the original series and others have at least a decade of experience. That said, however, there are exceptions, but they wouldn't be prevalent enough to make an impact of this magnitude. But to understand this properly, we need to break down HOW A DRAGON BALL SUPER EPISODE IS CREATED! Making an episode is very difficult. Before a series like Super premieres, usually half a year of pre-production is required to create an efficient schedule. What do I mean by schedule? A common misconception within the animation industry is that Toei Animation makes each episode of Dragon Ball Super in the week leading up to its airing, meaning when episode 1 ends on Saturday morning, they begin making the next episode right after. This is untrue. So how does it work? Toei Animation is an animation company with many other shows other than Dragon Ball Super under its umbrella. When rights holders to Dragon Ball wanted something to follow the end of Dragon Ball Kai, they decided to create a new TV show called Dragon Ball Super. Toy Animation then creates a team of animators to work on Super's episodes. You with me so far? The members of Dragon Ball Super's animation team are all subject to change, but they have remained relatively consistent throughout Super's run thus far. Now, this is where it gets a little bit more complicated than many of you might have anticipated. Each animation department is broken into a hierarchy, and that looks a little like this. Right at the top, you have your supervising director. This position is usually held by Tadayoshi Yamamoto. His job is to oversee and organize all of the animation supervisors as well as key animators for their given episodes, making sure that they finish on time. More on that time thing later. He makes sure that their animations are keeping to the character sheets provided also. Speaking of character sheets, these character designs for Dragon Ball Super were also done by Mr. Yamamoto, who has also filled the position of character designer. Directly beneath the supervising director, we have the chief animation supervisor. More often than not, this falls onto Mr. Takio Ide. He has overall responsibility for the quality of the animated product which he oversees. Now this could be a number of episodes at a given time. His job is to aid in delivering consistent animation on time and to screen it through Yamamoro. Beneath the chief animation supervisor, we have the animation supervisors. Finally, we have a right that some actual animators. Familiar faces in this role include Naoki Tate, Shuichiro Manabe, Masahiro Shimanuki, and Osamu Ishikawa. One or two of these guys are assigned to a given episode and alongside their key animators and in-between artists, work towards producing their assigned episodes for their deadline. The animation supervisor's job is to maintain the animation quality and to correct any animation submitted to them by their underlings to ensure consistency within the episode. They also provide key animations. Think of these guys as the bosses of each episode. So if those are the bosses of each episode, there must be people who work for them. Enter key animators, which as the name indicates, work to create keyframes for animations. A notable figure within this role would be Naotoshi Shida, who provided key animation for a portion of the Beerus Goku fight in the movie Battle of Gods. The key animators usually are assigned a portion of an episode to animate by their animation supervisor. These portions which are assigned are called cuts, and there could be as many as 300 cuts in a given episode. That's a lot of drawing! For those of you who are unfamiliar with the term keyframes, an animation is made up of those keyframes. Frames are the drawings or illustrations provided by the artist involved. For example, a fully animated sequence might have as many as 24 drawings or frames. All of these are not keyframes. In order to spread out work effectively, key animators draw the keyframes. These are the most important shots in the animated sequence which the viewer spends most of their attention focusing on. But I hear you asking, if the key animators only do the important shots in the animation, what makes up the rest? I'm glad you asked. Beneath that again we have the in-between artist, who works to link the keyframes together using, you guessed it, in-between frames. Combining these keyframes with the in-between frames creates a smooth running animation cut. But the real question is, how does this differ from Dragon Ball Z's process? 
on Z you would have different teams as opposed to how Super works where it's kind of just like independent supervisors for each episode and they're on their own rotation time. The animators under them aren't necessarily on the same rotation time as their supervisor. So while the supervisor might have like eight weeks or something, the animators probably have less. They might have two to four weeks or something like that. It, it, it varies. That was very different to how things worked on the original three series where a team very much meant a team. It was Supervisor and his team of animators. So let's recap. Right at the top, we have the Supervisor and Director. Down from that, we have the Chief Animation Supervisor. Beneath him, we have a number of talented animation supervisors. Beneath each of those, we have even more key animators. And beneath them, we have in-between artists. The reason most shows need six to eight months of pre-production is due to scheduling. And that is the most important aspect of an animated show like Super that runs throughout the year with no off-season. Your schedule needs to be healthy. We need a healthy schedule because each episode ideally requires eight to eleven weeks to create. That's right, I said eight to eleven weeks. Each animation supervisor usually is given an episode to work on for a number of weeks. With their storyboard artist and a team of animators, which can vary, they create an episode out of practically nothing. The animation supervisor for episode 10 was Osamu Ishikawa. We can see he worked on episode 2 here, so that means that he had 8 weeks to create episode 10. The next episode he supervised after this was episode 17, meaning he had 7 weeks to finish that particular one. Assign each of these animation supervisors an episode and we should have a functioning schedule in theory. Each supervisor working on an episode two months in advance, submitting it on time and being assigned another one right after to keep the wheels rolling. However, this is where Super imploded, for lack of a better term. The first four episodes by and large were produced to a satisfactory quality, with minor exceptions from episode four. However, fans of the show were shocked and outraged with the release of episode five. The animation supervisor for this episode was Naoki Tate. His own animation is on show in the episode as well as the likes of Ken Otsuka, a key animator, who was responsible for this fantastic cut in the episode. However, parts which were scrutinized heavily were cuts of animation like this. Clearly, unnamed animators' rough animations push forward to get the episode out on time. These are clear signs that Toei Animation's Dragon Ball Super schedule was crumbling. And so early into its lifespan, this only meant that things were going to get worse. To illustrate my point that this wasn't the animator's fault, but instead the time restraints they were under. Naoki Tate, the animation supervisor of the episode, had worked on Dragon Ball Z back in the 1990s. He is a senior animator with over 20 years experience in the industry. The next episode he supervised was episode 11, and was undoubtedly one of the most well animated episodes in the arc. Despite fan outrage, however, the damage had been done. The powers that be rushed Dragon Ball Super's pre-production, not allowing it time to create enough of an episode buffer to produce quality episodes consistently. And it was only going to get worse. I think Studio One Pack is one of the most transparent studios who work on Super. They list their times on their website. And so as an example, uh, episode 23 aired on December 13th and it didn't start production until December 1st. To help better illustrate my point, here is a very short animation of Goku turning his head that I produced. I used the model sheets Toei uses for Goku, and I tried to stay as on model as I could. This took me roughly 9 hours to produce. Let's see what it looks like when I take only 1 hour to produce this same animation sequence. As you can see, there is a severe dip in quality. But as you saw earlier, I am fully capable of producing a satisfactory product. However, when time is removed from the equation, the end result is compromised heavily. A YouTuber and artist by the name of Mark Krilly made a similar series on the subject, which if you are interested in the process of illustration, I highly recommend you give it a look-see. Episode 28 aired on January 24th, 2016. This arc served to introduce Goku, Universe 7, and the audience to a whole new cast of characters. These included Shampa, Hit, Kaba, and Vados to name but a few. Once Frieza had been defeated at the hands of Goku in the arc prior, a certain amount of time has passed with the arc kicking off during one of Whis's training sessions for Goku and Vegeta. Shampa reunites with his brother and together they agree to host a tournament. If Beerus' Universe 7 wins, he gets the Super Dragon Balls. Orbs that when gathered have no limit to what you can wish for. And if Shampa wins, he gets Universe 7's Earth transported to his. They agree on a 5 vs 5 tournament where the winner stays on. And thus was the premise for the arc. 
The first thing of note in this arc was an improvement in animation overall. With the arc being 14 episodes in length, none of the episodes are animated particularly poorly. Which might not seem like high praise, and it's not, but considering the previous two arcs overall quality, this was a noticeable and welcomed improvement, indicating that the show was heading in the right direction. That's kind of Dragon Ball's retelling arc in a nutshell, it was just, it was not good it looked bad it was rushed it was amateur and then to kind of solve that when it came to the universe six arc they introduced like two supervisors and so it was it was the same amount of time but the work was being divided up into yeah what's with the, the blue hair i thought they were yellow <laughs> classic goku plan i'm gonna try this thing but probably won't work and if i fail then i'll die I mean, he's spending all this time explaining what he just did, but like that whole time Kaioken is like damaging his body. <laughs> okay, I'm into that. <laughs> okay, that's pretty cool. I'll give you that. <laughs> and Goku just powered through it by being powerful, I guess. It is way better though. Definitely. Yeah, right off the bat, that was much better. Oh, I'm enjoying that. <laughs> that was way better. What was the deal with his blue hair? Super Saiyan Blue. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> That's in the next series. Is that why he was able to use the, the Kaioken as well as being the Super Saiyan? Because I always thought, like, when I was younger, I always remember being like, oh, wouldn't it be so cool if Goku went Kaioken while he was in Super Saiyan? <laughs> yeah, well, that, that had me grinning like an idiot anyway. I was like, yay! <laughs> I didn't even know I wanted this. <laughs> What did you guys think of Goku's last fight during the Universe 6 tournament? Was that when he was fighting Hit? That was, that was fucking awesome. That was incredible. And the music in it as well, that was, they executed that very well. Episode 5 was very infamous for its animation, but I feel like the animation of a lot of Super, up until recently, like even with like, even after they got out of the movies, a lot of the animation in the Universe 6 arc was very hit or miss. And it's been kind of, very kind of iffy to say the least. Oh, it's, just, it's much, much better. But uh, the, the, the thing is, they, they're not keeping it consistent. Like there, there's moments where it's like, holy shit, is this Dragon Ball? And then there are moments like, yeah, that's Dragon Ball. <laughs> Actually made me feel, it gave me the vibe of Dragon Ball Z a bit. And I love that because I missed it so much from that because again, it was the, the comedy in it and that was a serious moment. And I'm glad that they didn't make it funny. Oh, when he um, fought Jiren. No, no, not Jiren, um, Hit. Do you know when he did like the Super Saiyan Blue with the Kaioken and that's how he beat him? And it was, I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, it was pretty class. What I kind of, the way I see it now, and this is someone who like completely fucking uneducated in Dragon Ball Z, is going Super Saiyan was massive because they had all of Dragon Ball where there was nothing like that. So then when you go Super Saiyan on Namek, it was a huge thing. And then going Super Saiyan 2, was kind of like even that extra, it was the, the double punch or the, the double whammy or whatever you want to call it. And I kind of feel after it went Super Saiyan 3, I was like, oh, we're just going to keep churning these out. Aside from some minor hiccups, the arc reached its conclusion as Universe 7 defeated Universe 6, with Hit throwing the final match against Monaka. Directly following this arc, however, we were greeted by something we had not witnessed in this series to this point, filler. Thanks to the internet, many fans now understood the purpose of these types of episodes. They were animation light and easy to produce comparatively to their story-driven counterparts. What did this mean for the series? Something big. Okay, now why does he have blue hair? <laughs> what? Awful lot of blue in this show now. <laughs> that is Trunks, isn't it? I thought he had purple hair. Oh fuck, not this! It's always, no. It's always the same. No! Did they just fucking kill? Turn it off. I can't see any more of this. That was just sad. <laughs> um, his silhouette in the smoke, it really looked like a uh, Ryuk for a second. 
I don't know how, but it did. I don't, the way the hair wasn't super evil, like triangular red eyes. Holy shit, did they just kill Bulma? I can see why he'd be uh, feeling blue. Oh my come god. On, come on. As long as the mother dies, like, the mother has to die and then they just go berserk. What's with all the blue now? Why is his hair blue? Fair enough. I mean, like, yeah. puberty hits us all hard, you know? Nico, you really felt for trunks and black scared the shit out of me. And then you see black's face and you see that it's Goku. You're like, well, what the fuck is going on? I think that the animation has gotten a lot better. I don't really think that it's like top tier in the whole like animation industry. It's certainly not that, but I think that just on its own, separate from everything else, I think that it's definitely gotten better than it has before. On June 12th, 2016, episode 47 aired for the first time for all to see. The episode received the highest rating in the series up until this point. It also sported a new darker theme to the delight of many fans across the globe. While reintroducing high stakes to the world of Dragon Ball, the premiere episode also featured fantastic animation by the talented Naoke Tate, which helped raise Dragon Ball Super standards even higher. The arc covers the events of Trunks' last ditch effort to save his timeline from certain destruction. Having taken care of the androids, Cell, and Majin Buu in his timeline, he witnesses the murder of his mother Bulma, killed at the hands of a Goku lookalike going by the name of Black. So is this present day or future? Oh, this guy again. Oh, I don't like him. So who is this black guy? This one is really racist. <laughs> I did not mean it that way. This guy's racking up a serious kill count. What? Is that one of the fusion earrings? Fuck off. <laughs> so do we have like a nega Goku now? He's like, no. That's not Goku. I mean, I thought it was really cool. I like that would definitely get me interested in the storyline anyway. Like, you know, it kind of puts the first clip you showed me to shame where it was just like him jumping around this purple cast, missing punches in, in a single shot. I mean, that it looked much nicer, you know? My was she a character before or was she made for a super? Because like I've literally never seen her before, so I was just kind of like, oh man, she thought she could kill that thing with a shotgun. <laughs> well, she didn't think she could kill it, but like she thought that would do anything. Well, that was class. That would definitely get me to watch the next episode. That bit at the end though, with Goku or whoever that guy is, that was unreal. To be honest, like it, it, it have a really bad start, and it took me a while to get into it. I think uh, it was 60 episodes in before I, I actually re revisited it, because I remember you were telling me about the uh, tournament art, and I said, oh, there, there's some cool moments in it. So you see clips and stuff, and I sort of skipped the uh, the first two arcs. You know, and you're used to Goku being so such a happy, childish character, you would not think that he would hurt a fly, you know? And there you see him killing Bulma, you know? It was it was fucking traumatic. Yeah, the tension it creates, and it, it, it kind of reminds me of when uh, the cell, uh, like his uh, his base form, when, when he first appears, that tension, that fear it imposes. It was quite brilliant, quite brilliant done, I think. I think what helped the series the most when it hit the future Trunks arc and the animation improved quite a lot. World Trigger had just ended and so we gained new animators from there. I think the biggest person that we gained was Futoshi Higashide who kind of basically soloed that entire arc and was one of the few people who could actually animate action consistently throughout the entire thing and that really helped. The MVP has been Shinichiro Miki as Zamasu. I think he has been incredible. He has not, that he carried that arc. Ryo Harukawa was voicing Vegeta when he was fighting against Goku Black and he was beating him up and talking about, you're just a fake Saiyan. And I just thought that that was just a great moment. I mean, the, the moment where Zamasu has Goku against the wall and he tells him that he killed his kids and Goku goes crazy, that was very touching. When Goku Black kills Bulma, I mean, these are, I mean, they're not good moments. These are terrifying moments, but they're, memorable like i'll never forget that it should be evident at this point that the animation schedule i spoke about earlier is in better standings during this arc thanks in no small part to conservative efforts towards the end of the universe 6 arc and the quote filler provided in between while the art style leaves little to complain about there were still shortcomings within this arc most obviously within the narrative continuity 
In short, the story itself was compelling, but towards the end it became apparent that they had lost sense of direction, with it failing to make coherent sense once they reached the conclusion. To go through the story of this arc is a video into and of itself, which I am sure I will get to eventually. But just know that this had fundamental problems which many fans noticed. The main issue being sourced towards the last episode of the arc surrounding its conclusion. With that said however, the Future Trunks or Goku Black arc managed to bring in the highest ratings in the show's history. And on November 6th, 2016, Dragon Ball Super surpassed Dragon Ball GT in episodes a mere week prior to its most climactic battle featuring Vegito and Merge Zamasu. It never felt right to me that sensu beans were crunchy. I don't know why. Like, they don't seem like they'd be crunchy. God. A fight that lasts an hour in Dragon Ball time. What was that, like 50 episodes? Okay. Ah, come here. What's happening with uh, Goku Black? What's his situation? Vegeta and Goku? Fuck. That's class. We love the fusion half. Huh? There are just no limits to this show. <laughs> Anime punches work in such a weird way. <laughs> Where like they've already connected, but then they're like, ah, they're, they keep powering the punch. It's like that's not how punches work. So is this God of one being or is this also fused? The animation here is incredible. It's really good. Oh, he also has a lightsaber, okay. I'm such a, even like now, I'm like, yeah, get him, Goku. <laughs> oh, come on. Cool. Animation is like leaps and bounds ahead like that. I didn't notice any part where I was like, ugh. How long have like, I don't know what they're, like, I'm gonna call them like Keyblades? Like, not like Kingdom Hearts, but like, <laughs> um, like where they could just make swords out of their energy or whatever. Like, how, how long has that been a thing? Oh, definitely improved. Really good, like it was well animated too. I definitely wanna watch that stuff. When they said, oh, we can only fuse for an hour, I'm like, I remember something that took five minutes before. <laughs> that was a long time. Due to merchandise sales, I'll get to that later, and fan enthusiasm surrounding Dragon Ball. On October 12th, 2016, Shueisha established an initiative called the Dragon Ball Room. This Dragon Ball Room was essentially a department created with the sole purpose of making new Dragon Ball content separate from Toei Animation's Dragon Ball Super anime. This would serve as the new Dragon Ball manga's home ground from that point onwards. Before the next and final arc I will be covering in this video, Toei Animation produced 9 filler episodes, spanning episodes 69 through 78, and I love them. In these nine episodes, we get a fun self-contained installment where Goku and Vegeta fight Arale, who is herself a Toriyama creation from his Dr. Slump series. We get a fantastic baseball episode and a small two-episode stint where Goku is being hunted by Hit the Assassin from Universe 6. However, it is the two-episode mini-arc with Goku and Krillin I would like to talk about briefly if I can. Episode 75 was, by far and away, my favorite episode of these nine fillers that came our way. Why? because its storyboard is a prime example of great storyboarding. The use of empty space and zoomed away shots help get across to the viewer how isolated and self-conscious Krillin is without saying a word. Too often in anime do we get blocks of dialogue explaining what is going on in characters' heads and why we should be invested in this scene. And while that isn't terrible, I think it is at the very least unnecessary when you can show this to your audience instead. It's arguably the most beautiful episode in the entire series. At Jumpfest 2016, during the third weekend of December, Toei released a promotional teaser video for the upcoming new arc, which it dubbed the Universe Survival Arc. More and more information would make its way to the public through online articles, stream, or V-Jump magazine, all pointing to February 5th, 2017 as the premiere of the new arc. What do you guys think of the Universe Survival arc? That's pretty good. I like all those episodes, but I just feel like it's kind of dragging out too long. There's like 50 different fights going on at the same time, so like one episode would be on 
one fight and then like it'd be like meanwhile so you've progressed like a minute but you've watched like five episodes but you've seen like five different fights so only a minute is passing the fight well goku w w went to the uh the, the other world uh to try to recruit frieza and i think that scene worked really well and the whole episode as well just the, uh, the, the the way it pans out it's not it's not like the previous ones where like they can decide what they want to be the whole scene is like uh it's very refreshing, you know, it gave me hope that this series is, is going to get better from this now. I do think that there are some pretty good moments in the universe survival arc so far. Um, I think that Kale's a pretty interesting character. I think that she's, she's definitely better than the character she's based on. I feel like she has a more reasonable reason for kind of going nuts with anger. I would say the most fun I had watching an episode would have to be when Kale went berserk during the Tournament of Power because that was a complete nostalgia trip down memory lane. From a visual perspective, there was a certain change introduced that viewers became abundantly aware of. As early as the first episode's airing, a new thick outline with a heavily contrasted color palette had been added to Super's art direction. The, the line art, you know, the outlines, how they kind of blurred that out and they kind of give you like the kind of effect where the light is, is really blurred. I don't like that. The, the line isn't strong. It's not really like, it's not prominent. You know, it's, it's really blurred out. I'm not really a fan of that. Similar to the Universe 6 arc, which saw the main cast take on a rival universe, the Universe Survival arc sees our universe take on numerous others. However, this iteration takes place in a multi-universe battle royal of sorts pitting Universe 7's 10 best warriors against the representatives from seven other universes. An interesting concept which had yet to have been done in the series. And it just so happens that this arc would be the longest too. As of making this video, it still has not reached its conclusion. Currently standing at 35 episodes in length as of October 15th, 2017, surpassing the Future Trunks arc already by 14 episodes and eclipsing the first three arcs which stood at roughly 14 episodes apiece. However, while the promise of a multi-universe battle royale sounded interesting, there was a lot of groundwork needed for the occasion to make sense to every viewer. Therefore, the first 14 episodes of the arc would be set aside to reintroduce the characters that had been seldom seen in the Dragon Ball Super series up until this point. Goku sets out and attempts to find, convince, and recruit numerous warriors from the show's long history. Krillin, Tien, Master Roshi, Vegeta, Piccolo, Gohan, Majin Buu, 18, and for the first time since the Cell arc, Android 17 makes his Dragon Ball Super debut. When I heard that Piccolo and Buu were going to be in the tournament, I was thinking that, oh, they're going to train with Beerus and Whis as well, and they're going to get Kog Key, and they're going to be on their level, and it's going to be a more interesting... It's not just going to be about, oh, who's stronger. It's going to be about, like, the strengths and weaknesses of, of all the characters' different techniques. And I feel like that is... They're kind of doing that now with the universe survival arc, but I feel like they've kind of done it a bit sloppily and just how they've had characters just going, I've been training off screen. Like what training have you been doing to like get on the level of gods? <laughs> On July 23rd, 2017, Dragon Ball Super aired its 100th episode, an achievement worthy of commemorating for any long-standing TV show. Masako Nozawa, who had been the voice of Goku for well over 30 years, came out of the woodwork and released a statement regarding the recent milestone. We hit 100 episodes in the blink of an eye. I was shocked when I heard about it. At this rate, we'll probably reach 200 episodes in another eye blink. Lately, I've been receiving messages at my house from fans daily. It makes me so happy. My goal is for Dragon Ball Super to reach 700 episodes. Seven for the number of Dragon Balls. So all you fans, keep cheering me on. Is there anything that you would like to change about the show? <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot that I change personally. I personally feel at least that they messed up a lot on the handling of God Key. Goku turns Super Saiyan God and then it just all goes back into his base form. I personally thought it would have been really interesting if that like messed with his Super Saiyan or something. And so he's just stuck in his base form. Like, you know, he shouldn't have like 13 different forms that he can like pick and choose from. It should just be simply like his resting state and then his powered up state. The other thing that I feel though is while they have done this with Vegeta and having him like get God Key as well, I feel like they should have given God Key to a lot of the other characters. There's a reason why Super is what it is. Like if you take out one element of it, there's it's, it won't be as Dragon Ball as it is. So, I mean, they're doing the best they can with it. So, I'm just gonna wait and see how the story pans out before I make any judgments. Well, I don't think so. Cause like, if I changed anything, it wouldn't be Toriyama anymore. You know, 
So I'd say just leave it the way it is and polish up the animation <laughs> for fuck's sake. <laughs> I think they should kind of bring it out as a season rather than a week to week thing because that kind of makes it kind of boring. Like if they brought out a season with 20 episodes, you'd be like, oh, it's all building up to this one thing. But then nowadays it'd be like, oh, there's like 50 weeks of, tr of filler. And then there's like 10 weeks of something that's really good. So like if they kind of compressed it and not did a week to week and did like a season by season, I think it'd be more consistently good. I like the fact that there's a lot of lore building, but I'm going to be honest with you. I feel like the lore building is not going to go anywhere. I certainly hope it does, but I feel like we're being introduced to all these new characters and universes and we're not going to get development for that many of them. My big issue with Super is that everything feels self-contained. That doesn't feel like there's a big adventure going on. It's just a very clear cut. Here's Battle of Gods. Here's Resurrection F. Here's Universe 6. Here's Future Trunks arc. Here's the tournament arc. And it's just, that doesn't... It doesn't feel like a natural flow between arcs and i think one of the biggest examples for me is between the copy vegeta arc it just ends and the next episode boom the future trunks arc starts and it's just like it, it's so jarring it doesn't feel natural and when it came to the end of the future trunks arc and we were leading ourselves through all of the the mid arc filler material whatever you want to call it up to the universe survival arc it just felt like a countdown it didn't feel like we were building to anything it was just like okay and the arc starts now it just feels like movies still having hit 100 episodes it has become evident that dragon ball is not the ratings giant that it once was in either the west or the east in many ways, this is largely due to oversaturation of the market and the production of other fantastic long and short running franchises within the same genre. When Dragon Ball was released in the West, there was nothing else like it on television and children across the globe lapped it up. Nowadays, shows with the scale and scope of Dragon Ball are numbering higher and higher each year. So it's no wonder the Japanese and Western TV markets are not set on fire with the return of Dragon Ball. The ratings are not bad by any means. They're actually quite good. However, the reason Dragon Ball is receiving more and more backing from Toei is down to one word, merchandising. While Dragon Ball has faltered in the anime department, it has taken up right where it left off in the merchandising section. Dragon Ball was and still is a merchandising juggernaut. Looking at the licensing and sales figures for the Dragon Ball franchise in the mid 2000s, it's clear to see that the numbers were huge. However, in 2010, there was a severe dip in the licensing department reaching an all-time low in 2013 before the release of Battle of Gods. Between 2013 and 2015, merchandising increased by almost 40%. With the release of Dragon Ball Super, that figure took a large upswing, placing it into the realm of competition that One Piece occupies. So at the moment, Dragon Ball Super only has an upside in the marketing department. Would you recommend Dragon Ball Super to a friend? If they are already a fan of Dragon Ball, I'd say maybe, depending on like what exactly it is that they like that they like the series for. Mm, I would recommend to a friend that has already seen Dragon Ball Z, but for someone who's who haven't seen it yet, no. Oh, if it was Dragon Ball Z, guaranteed like, but not really with Dragon Ball Super. I'd recommend they watch Dragon Ball Z first if they haven't, and. Then I, you know, tell them to give it a shot. I'd let them know about the animation first, you know, like, so they don't get shocked and be like, "What the? Why the fuck are you into this?" You know. From early June to mid July, I lived in Osaka, Japan. It was on this trip I started production on this documentary. My goal was to cover all the important events of the series from its inception to its 100th episode, and I wanted to see what Dragon Ball meant to as many people as I could. On one of my final days in the country, I decided to visit Universal Studios Japan, hearing that there was a production celebrating Shonen Jump in the form of two 4D shows, one for Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, and one for Dragon Ball. The real 4D experience is a cinematic attraction at Universal Studios Japan. It depicts CG characters engaging in monumental battles which are projected in a theater within the park. And I gotta say, everything about this was fantastic. From the greeters at the gate to the music playing while waiting in line, it all served to further immerse myself within the experience. 
We filed into the packed theatre, eagerly awaiting the show's commencement. I was sceptical at first, but by the end I was cheering, my hands miming along with the rest of the audience as Goku requests her energy to defeat the big bad of the feature. Surrounded by all of these people, of all ages, with their fingers pointing to the sky, I remembered what it was like to be filled with that childlike excitement cheering for my favourite characters on the screen. In this documentary, I wanted to chronicle what caused Dragon Ball Super to begin production, as well as the ups and downs the show has had thus far. I spoke to many different people from all walks of life, asking their opinion on my favourite series, and the answers were very enlightening. People seem to enjoy and dislike certain aspects for varying reasons. Some of the reasons were technical and others were based on feelings, and that made me look back at all the research I gathered. Our favourite shows are not the ratings they receive or the merchandise numbers they have. They are not complex animation sequences, video games, or money-hungry executive choices. It's passion. It's the excitement, the nostalgia, the discovery, the action, the sadness, the goosebumps. It's when one man's passion helps him reach out to millions of people. And in some cases, if he's lucky, it's when those millions of people reach back. Thanks for watching. How would you describe Dragon Ball Super in one word? Colorful. <laughs> Do you want me to be positive? Say what you like. Um, one word. Failure sticks out to me. Purely for the animation reason. And funny. You know. If you had to pick one? I'd say positive and say funny. <laughs> Meh. All right. <laughs> it's not really one word, but I would say kind of more of the same. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, aside from that first clip, which was like, I, I, after seeing it next to the other ones, it's just fucking atrocious. But, the, the last kind of three clips you show me, it seems like it's very true to Dragon Ball Z. So I'd imagine if you liked Dragon Ball Z or if you like Dragon Ball, like, it's just more of the same to enjoy in Dragon Ball Super. Mixed. Anime. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, is Dragon Ball one word or two words? <laughs> it's two. All right, um, super. <laughs> Uh, it just like it just seems like Dragon Ball Z again, but like more, I guess. <laughs> Somehow, I don't know. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you. <laughs> Informal with the fucking lights and camera. And just take it light, take it breezy. <laughs> yeah, like even even Kai, like it's 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 an anime, so there's a lot of. A lot of bullshit in there. I'm glad I didn't have to watch Goku learn how to drive. That was such a good it sounds like the like sounds like literally everything I would hate. It's like oh and like it just it, I I hear that Japanese Goku is different, but like it encapsulates like English voice Goku where it's like oh man I really like I need a train to stop that thing that's gonna destroy the world. But oh man I want to learn how to drive. Oh man I'm hungry. Uh. Cause he's an anime protagonist. He's hungry. I feel like I'm like this is gonna turn into a porno audition tape super quick. <laughs> also, I hate Japanese Grandma Goku. I, just, I get that they're like, you know, it's like, oh, you, you know, you've been with us forever, so you get to keep being Goku. But yeah. no, it just, just, it's, Goku isn't a Japanese grandma. <laughs> Did you record that? Yeah. Oh.